If you're joining us for the first time, my name is Steve and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And in the summer of 1996, I had just turned 12 years old. I think Bone Thugs in Harmony at the time had a song in the top 10 called The Crossroads. I'm wondering if any of you guys remember that, The Crossroads, great song. And I remember being so excited to go and visit my sister, Allison, for the first time because I hadn't seen her in a few months. I hadn't seen her since the day that the doctors had determined that her stomach cancer had really expanded beyond their ability to care for her. And her only option at this point was hospice. But we decided that we were going to send her to Tijuana, Mexico, to this center, really hoping for a miracle. And after months of talking with her on the phone, the time finally came for me in, to go down and get a visit. And when I first saw her, I thought that we were going to get the miracle that we were looking for. She had looked great. We had such a great conversation. And when I went to bed that night, I thought this is going to be a great week. But by the time I woke up in the morning, she had fallen into a coma and I found myself in this small little chapel staring at this statue of a crucified Jesus who is looking down at me. And I remember praying the most honest prayer I have ever prayed in my life. God, if you are real, save my sister. Three days later, she was dead. And at that moment, I remember so clearly that I had walked away from God because if God were powerful, if he were real, if he were good, then he would have saved my sister. As I think about this question, how can a good, a God who is good and all powerful, how can he allow suffering to happen? The truth is that if you live long enough, you will either find yourself asking this question or you will find yourself having people ask you, how can a sovereign God be sovereign in the midst of so much suffering. Now, the first thing that we have to do is actually understand this Christianese word that we use, which is the word sovereign. And the word sovereign actually comes from an old French word, souverain, which it contains two parts to it. It's above and reign, as in the reign of some kind of king. So in theology, this idea of sovereignty has to do with God having this supreme authority in which all things are under his control, which creates a bit of a gap for those of us who live life. Because if God is the supreme authority, if everything is in his control, then how come he doesn't prevent suffering? I wonder how many of you have found yourself asking that same question. In fact, it's a question that has haunted humanity and been something that humanity has asked since the moment that we fell. And there are countless books that help us try to understand and journey through suffering. And if you look at all of the world, the major world philosophies and all of the major world religions, you're going to find that there is going to be some kind of attempt to answer that question. And then how do we respond to suffering? So according to Buddhism, we see that suffering is an illusion, so just accept it. According to karma, suffering is because of your own actions, so pay it. According to fatalism, suffering is just a part of your destiny. It's a part of your fate, so endure it. And according to humanism, life is just about your individual happiness, so either avoid it or fix it. Now, while all of these viewpoints have merit, they can be a little bit too reductionistic. Now, this isn't an indictment on any of these philosophies or any of these religions, because I think that we, we're honest with ourselves. We all want that simple, tweetable statement that explains all of suffering that can be applied to every single situation. But we can't. Because we know that suffering is nuanced, that it's complicated, and that not all suffering looks exactly the same. It's why someone, no matter how well-intentioned they are, cannot overlay a one-size-fits-all formula to suffering that, and then call it comfort. It's the reason why I had very choice words for people who came up to me after experiencing the death of my sister who said, you know what, God has a reason for everything, so maybe God is teaching you something. And I remember just thinking and responding, well, if God wanted to teach me a lesson, well, I'm sure he could have taught me that lesson without having to take my sister's life. 
It's probably why I would have punched you in the face if you had said, well, the reason why your sister died is because of some kind of sin or bad behavior in your previous life. And that's just how karma works. So just deal with it. And it's why even with my newfound atheism that somebody couldn't just put their arm around my shoulder and said, well, you know what? God doesn't exist. And therefore the afterlife doesn't exist. And extinction is just inevitable. So just cheer up, buckaroo. None of those can explain everything about suffering and give us comfort. And so Timothy Keller actually argues that Christianity offers the most robust explanation of suffering because it doesn't boil down suffering into a single formula. But instead, what scripture does is like a mosaic. It takes the broken fragments left behind in human suffering and puts it together and redefines it in light of the cross. So in response to Buddhism, Christianity would say that suffering is real. In response to karma, suffering is often unfair, unwarranted, and independent from our behavior. In response to fatalism, Christianity would say that suffering is overwhelming and beyond what we can bear ourselves. In response to secularism, that suffering can be transcendent and even meaningful and even drive us deep into the heart of God. And so today, as we continue this series in Esther, we don't see this oversimplified explanation for suffering. We don't see God's abandonment in the midst of suffering, but we see God's invisible but sovereign hand at work through what seems like random coincidences.